So in the last few satsangs, um, you <clears throat> might remember that I've um, been focusing on uh, talking about how information is very significant to the seeking, even though sometimes um, it's said that it's not. Um, and when I mean it is said not necessarily by me, but in the broader um, spiritual teaching um, deliverance, there often is an emphasis that says the intellect is not important. Now, there's a good reason for that. Um, and that is because our thinking has developed into a very specific type of thinking. So what we know as the intellect um, is that specific movement of the intellect um, that is really intertwined with doership and attachment to outcome. And so if seeking comes from a place of doership and attachment to outcome, that particular seeking, that particular type of uh, intellect is not helpful. And so because it's recognized that um, the majority of the use of the intellect comes with that flavor in it, comes with that um, or is driven by a certain identity with what it believes it needs and how um, it sees the happenings of life and that is very personally that it made all these things happen. So given it's appreciated that that is generally what is what the intellect is, um, rightly so, a teaching will say you don't get anywhere because of the intellect. Because in fact, the seeker, the, the, the doership, the attachment to outcome, if that is seeking, then it is in fact compounding the problem that the seeker is trying to get away from. So like a dog chasing its own tail or someone trying to lift themselves up from their bootstraps. It doesn't work. Similarly, like someone trying to fill in a hole by digging, thinking the digging is somehow filling in the hole, whereas in fact, the more that they dig, thinking they're filling in the hole, the more they're actually exacerbating the problem. And so seeking done from uh, the thinking mind, and the thinking mind doesn't just mean thinking in general, it means a very specific type of thinking in this teaching. It means thinking coming from um, and infused with the belief in personal doership and the belief that my complete, completeness, my happiness, um, is going to my, my meaningfulness is going to be found through outcomes through circumstance, through how life turns out. And that um, thinking mind uh, really isn't uh, going to solve the problem, isn't going to take us closer to what it is we're really looking for. Now, if we look at it um, a little differently uh, and we explain the intellect in a different way or we define the intellect in a different way, then what we find is that the statement that says the intellect doesn't get us very far in spiritual teaching um, may not be that um, absolute. Um, so what I've just finished explaining is that if a teacher and a teaching uses the word intellect very specifically and particularly to um, the belief in personal doership or thinking infused with the belief in personal doership and the belief in attachment to outcome, then yes, you can say the intellect doesn't get us far. If, however, we change the definition of intellect, we broaden the definition of intellect, for example, 
then we might have to say, ah, the intellect is very important in the process of seeking. Now, this once again isn't saying that the intellect is important and so to say it's not important is wrong. It's about um, pointing out why and in what context you can say the intellect won't get you very far and what in another context why you can. And the significant thing for us to realize here is that the word intellect can easily be referring to different functions. Um, and that's uh, the, the case for all words. Words have a definition, and the definition is not a standard definition. I mean, there is a standard definition in a dictionary, for example. However, there are different dic dictionaries with different definitions, and they're generally pretty close. Um, but it's very clear that someone, when they're speaking, um, may not have the dictionary definition about a word. When they're thinking, they might um, define a word differently to the, defin to the dictionary. They might be using it in a specific context, because in a dictionary, a word can be used in many different contexts or, or have very, um, sometimes very different meanings for the same word. And it's very important to understand the context in which the word is being used, or not only the context, but the particular topic in which the word is being used. So you could have consciousness used in neuroscience, in the neuroscience field, and you might have consciousness used in um, an ethical field or a spirituality field. And the word consciousness is the same word, but in different in relation to different topics, then um, it makes sense that it can have a different meaning. And so if someone assumes it means one thing, whereas the speaker is using the word with a different um, intention or different meaning, then this is the problem, um, or this is a problem if we don't um, understand that. So if I talk about the intellect, firstly, we can include the working mind and the thinking mind as a, as a distinction. And both of those are parts of the intellect. The thinking mind is part of the intellect that um, is infused with this belief of doership and attachment to outcome. It is the basis of the psychological me. It is the basis of the suffering that is always attitudinal to the circumstance that happens. And um, it's about why did this happen to me? This shouldn't have happened. It's filled with regret and blame, looking into the future, worrying, um, identifying or having an idea of oneself. So a, a conceptual idea of oneself that is very deeply believed and so it feels very real it doesn't feel like a conceptual based identity but in fact when we start unpicking it we see that it is a conceptual based identity um, and so that essentially is uh, the thinking mind and it's a part of the intellect that is based on a completely false premise of who we are so a false identity then we have the working mind and the working mind is not a psychological um, identity based um, thought form but rather thoughts and concepts about functional um, practical applications so you might be thinking about what shopping you need to get you might be thinking about the best way to approach a problem you might need to calculate some things assess various options um, think about how to communicate with someone given a certain situation. So that is functional thinking. And it's very different to the me-based identity. Now, the working mind, this functional thinking, is not infused with suffering. It isn't a th type of thinking that includes an uncomfortableness with oneself. Um, 
quite unlike the thinking mind. Nonetheless, the working mind thinking um, may be wrong. So you might have um, an idea about the cost of something, for example, and you might include the cost of something in your calculations, and you could be wrong. So the concept in the working mind may actually be um, flawed. But it's not flawed in relation to who we are. It's not a flawed idea in relation to who we are. It's a f it's a inaccurate information about the external, the objective world. And but it's important to understand that you, the working mind can have wrong information. Um, now, when we're talking about the intellect, so we've just expanded the intellect into the working mind and the thinking mind. Now, when a teaching says that the intellect is not significant, not an important faculty in seeking, I suggest that they're talking about the thinking mind, the identity. And if the identity is active in the seeking, it's reinforcing itself. And the seeking is about that identity diminishing and weakening. And so if it's actually doing the seeking, it's counterproductive. And we can get very frustrated because it can seem like we're putting in a lot of effort. We, we might be putting in a lot of effort. The doer is saying, I will make this happen. I will achieve this. I need to achieve this because I need to get this happiness because I'm not complete and um, I've heard so many things about what's available. And so I'm going to do it. And so that very identity doing the seeking is the opposite of peace of mind, is the opposite of what liberation or the end of seeking delivers. <clears throat> if we then go beyond the explanation of intellect as the working mind and the thinking mind, we can throw contemplation in. Now, contemplation... Ordinarily, we could stick it into the working mind. Um, however, if you like, you can create a new subcategory that may be the subcategory of the working mind, or you can put it alongside the working mind. And contemplation is thinking very much, um, well, contemplating about the nature of reality, the nature of life, questioning who we are, what it's all about, what's important, what are we really looking for. Um, and that contemplation can be infused with um, space, can be infused with, so it's a type of thinking that you could when you look at it, when you when it's when it's happening, it, it could be a meditative type of thinking. Um, so that's why it's called contemplation, because it's a contemplative thinking. It's not where you are um, highly engaged to get an outcome, but rather allowing a curiosity, allowing um, an unfolding of. Um, of thought, but thought that is very specific to uh, spiritual seeking and really has this um, characteristic of just unfolding. Um, so you can, if you like, put in this other category as opposed to calculating mathematics and um, uh, trying to work out social relations or plan um, practical matters for work. So that could be in the working mind. That's functional thinking. Um, and then this contemplative thinking is specifically in relation to spiritual seeking. And it can include moments where you actually stop actively thinking and appreciate the presence And understand that the presence, your own beingness, appreciating the experience of being alive, of 
that what is all of this? It's all there's this experience that is very much part of the um, very much part of the contemplative thinking. What's also very important is that contemplative thinking can't be completely conceptual. And what I mean by completely conceptual is that we have to appreciate that what we're con contemplating, what is being pointed at in the teachings that we're being asked to look at, to see what is being pointed at, is life right, right here. And so that means dropping out of our head where we're very used to being and in our head we can create a sort of image of here and assess everything in the image of here. So we will imagine a conversation between myself and uh, someone else and maybe think that we are investigating the present moment by imagining a conversation. And so when we contemplate even pleasure and pain in, in life, for example, if that's what um, we're thinking about, so the, the concept in the teachings is that the flow of life, meaning circumstance, which is you know, every moment of the waking day where we're present, life is either pleasure or pain. Um, and that's inevitable. And we're not in control of the amount of pleasure and pain that's delivered. So we might be contemplating that, thinking that we are looking at the pleasure and pain of the flow of life that is being pointed at in the teachings, and think we're looking at it because we're thinking about the pleasure and pain of life. So we might think, oh yes, yesterday I stubbed my toe, that was pain in the moment. Now there's a validity to that, to think about an example of pain in the moment. Now there's a difference between thinking about pain in the moment that happened as compared to really feeling, for example, pleasure or pain in the moment right here. So if you stub your toe in the moment and you can feel the pain and then the thought arises, ah, this is pain in the moment. Now, that means that the concept has, has seen the present moment and has recognized the concept as a description of what is here in the present moment. So as it gets um, experienced and the matching concept comes in, that's where we understand more deeply what the concept is really pointing to. So if you're contemplating the pleasures and pain of the flow of life, and there's the flow of life is all, you might not need to wait until you stab your, stub your toe you might be able to smell a rose and realize as you're smelling the rose, ah, this is pleasure in the moment until a bee stings you on the nose and then it's pain in the moment. Um, so the teachings are pointing to the, the present moment. And so in contemplation, um, not all of the thinking should be limited to the head, but rather our intellectualizing, our understanding of the concepts, our understanding of how they fit into the overall framework from time to time very much has to investigate your own life experience and put a tick next to each concept and many ticks next to a concept. Um, once we have confirmed it, as being a valid description of our own life experience. The more ticks we put next to a concept based on confirming it, the more um, uh, the more deeply ingrained it becomes and the less conceptual and the more known. And that's a very important 
uh, quality of the deepening of the intellectual understanding. So um, the the understanding as described in this teaching has to start off as an intellectual understanding. So a teaching will say something to us. It will describe something. And you might hear it and have no idea what it's saying. So, you know, if it was said in a different language, you've heard it, but you have no capacity to grasp what is said intellectually because the words are not understood by yourself, so you can't comprehend the conceptual construction or the, the content of the concept. You, it doesn't even need to be in a foreign language. It could be using um, words you don't understand in English, um, or you might have been thinking about something else, and you didn't grasp what it says conceptually. If, on the other hand, you've heard what it says conceptually, like, for example, what we're really looking for is peace of mind and not pleasure. Pleasure is pleasure, it's momentary, and it won't deliver us the happiness that we're really looking for. And most human beings are designed such that they are completely convinced that happiness will come when their circumstance improves. So everything I've said there in the last two minutes, you can press rewind and listen to it again, is basically a concept um, that says what we're looking for is peace of mind and happiness. Also, peace of mind is happiness. Happiness is not to be found in pleasure, and yet most people think that their happiness will be found in pleasure. Now, that's a concept, and someone can say, I understand what you have said intellectually. So there's nothing in what you have described that I haven't been able to understand. I know all the words, it's, it, it makes sense. And they might say, but that's not my experience. Um, I can't confirm it beyond intellectually understanding what you're saying. I don't know that to be, let's say, the case or true. You could Let's use the word true. Um, however, as they investigate the concept, which means contemplate the concept, repeat it to themselves and become clear on what it is saying intellectually, and then start observing, for example, that yes, in this moment there is a belief that winning this business contract will give me happiness. And so if the person sees their attachment to winning the contract, believing it will give them happiness, losing the contract and feeling this sense of um, uncomfortableness on the level of oneself because the contract has been lost and they might recognize, ah, there is what is being described as my deep attachment, belief, assumption that my happiness would have been delivered by the winning of the contract. Now, let's not pretend that the winning of the contract has no effect. The winning of the contract, if it delivered, let's say, a financial benefit, can be seen as a pleasurable outcome, pleasure in the moment, so f um, more finances. So you could say financial pleasure in the moment. It could be that the contract ends up being financial pain. You might think it's going to be profitable and then something goes wrong and it actually costs you money. And if that's the case, then your hope that it was going to be financial pleasure in the moment turns out that it is financial pain in the moment. Now, there is a difference between financial pleasure and financial pain, just like um, physical pleasure and physical pain. If we had the choice, if we were in control, then we would obviously pick pleasure over pain. However, the pleasure over pain is picked not because it will actually give us happiness, 
but because it will give us ple pleasure. And the body will naturally gravitate towards pleasure because of its biological preferences. So because it has biological preferences, which are different to the attachment to outcomes that I was talking about before, because it has biological preference, it will move away from pain and towards pleasure when available. However, the psychological sense of self um, that is attached to pleasure, thinking that pleasure will deliver happiness, that is different to the biological preference, and it falls more into the category of psychological identity, me, the me, the thinking mind. And that's the suffering. So the body with its biological preferences will always move towards pleasure and away from pain. The psychological me will be convinced that pleasure is where their happiness is to be found. So as this is seen um, by someone who is now contemplating the pointers, the spiritual teachings, the understanding can go deeper and deeper and deeper, meaning that the intellectual understanding is becoming total understanding, where it's no longer a concept. It's got, oh, I see Yes, I see that there is a deeply ingrained belief that my happiness will be found in financial pleasure. So that part of the concept gets ticked off. Um, we might get financial um, pleasure and then we realize, but this hasn't delivered me some ongoing happiness for the rest of my life. We might see that it did deliver um, uh, improvements in life on a circumstantial pleasure level. We can put a tick to that. But it didn't deliver the happiness I thought it would deliver. So then we put another tick next to it, a tick next to the part that says, but it won't deliver ongoing happiness. Um, and as that is seen over and on, over and over again for many, many different pleasures, um, the understanding starts going deeper and deeper and deeper. Now, at some point in our life we didn't know what our name was and we would i mean the process of this is um i'll use it as a as a metaphor as an example it's not exactly right because as a young child um, our intellect isn't really that developed but let's say someone came along and said your name is Roger. And they explain what a name is. Say that's a, na a label by which this body-mind organism gets known and referred to. And so whenever anyone calls your name, which is Roger, it means they want to talk to you. Um, and they are addressing you. Um, and the, the, the person goes, oh, this is an interesting concept. I'm glad I've heard and learnt about names. So they say, I understand you, the concept um, that you're describing. And then, you know, a couple of hours later, someone calls their name, Roger. And just keep the person, Roger, just keeps on doing what they're doing. And then the person says, Roger, Roger, and no response. Um, and then the... Um, person that explained about names comes up and says, hey, Roger, don't you remember my explanation about names? Um, that your name is Roger, and when someone calls Roger, you means they're referring to you. And he goes, yes, yes, I understand. Um, I, I remember. He said, but the, the guy's been ca calling you for the last hour, and you haven't responded. You go, oh, really? Oh, um, I didn't... Uh, I didn't hear him. The reality is that the understanding that your name is Roger, or that my name is Roger, was intellectual and it wasn't total. And in time, the 
understanding that my name is Roger becomes deeply ingrained such that I don't even have to think about it. So I don't hear. So at first, as it's becoming total, I will hear the name Roger and then go, oh, Roger is my name. That means someone wants to talk to me. And then like, yes, how can I help you? And so at that point, we can see that the intellectual understanding is there, but it's not... Um, fully integrated into our system. At some point, we find that the response is automatic. And that means that the understanding has become total. And you could say it is no longer intellectual. On the other hand, you can say, well, the understanding your name is Roger is actually intellectual, but very deeply ingrained now such that it is automatic and spontaneous. And so the example also that is used, or the metaphor that's used, is knowing that you're home when you come to your house. You don't need someone to tell you that you're in your house. You don't need to remind yourself, oh, this is my house. You, you know intuitively, you know, you recognize everything of the house. So... You just know that I'm home. Um, and that, you can see, in both situations has happened because there's a familiarity with um, being in your home. You go there every day and it looks the same and you remember the features. And so then there is, a at a certain point, if you were to see the flicking through a book and you see pictures, you go, oh, that's my home. Um, and the same with your name. And the same happens with an understanding about life. Such that when it's complete and total, it doesn't feel like an intellectual understanding. And when it doesn't feel like an intellectual understanding, we might think that it has nothing to do with the intellect. However, what we might not appreciate is that that total intellectual understanding was very much a process of observing life in a particular way, thinking about life, changing beliefs, having insights and clicks about why um, certain things happen and having an explanation for why certain things happen instead of maybe the old explanation that um, we come to see as being naive maybe and as the old explanation um, falls away because we have a new explanation and we think about it when we see events from different circumstances or many different events and we see the dynamics that we've now come to at first understand intellectually and we see them over and over again without us knowing what's happening is our whole system is rewiring so as we are coming to know life differently know ourself differently um, what we have at the moment or when before the seeking really starts making a difference, is we have a deeply ingrained knowing of ourself. But that knowing is based on a set of beliefs, a set of interpretations of life that happen to be quite misguided. And they were put in place at a very young age because of the society that we grow up in, the attitudes and priorities and ideas about life that our parents have, that our teachers had, and the fact that life is experienced um, a certain way, that objects in the world are picked up by the senses, more or less in the same way by everyone. And it creates an impression of the world and it creates an impression of how things happen. And that impression is based on a surface interpretation of how things happen and we have no reason really to dive deeper. Um, and so that interpretation gets put in place. And it happens to be quite a, um, well, 
surface interpretation of things, which means there it turns out there's a lot more happening beneath the surface than is evident on the surface. And so once we start diving beneath the surface, but once we start thinking about dynamics that we could in fact spend a whole lifetime not thinking about, we start to get an appreciation of life that is different to what gets set in place. And that appreciation deepens, uproots the old way of seeing it, and then a new way of seeing it kicks in. For a while, that new way is in, in process, and the old way isn't completely kicked out. And so we have a, an oscillating between the old and the new. Um, and the old tends to be this sense of self where we feel very much separate. We know ourself only as the physical, a disconnection to the part of ourself that is um, less tangible, more formless. So the consciousness aspect. Um, and when that happens, there is more attachment to outcomes, more investment in um, outcomes and feeling life is very personal. And that's where all the suffering in life arises. So there's a, an oscillating between the two. And as we um, start to connect to the part of ourself that is um, what we could call ever-present, uh, exists underneath the stream of um, thought-based um, identity and start to rest and ground ourselves in that aspect of the human being, then the, um, the effects of this attachment and this taking life very personally start to get weakened and we start to feel that there is a different potential, a different potential of being in life. What we find is our identity, um, our wiring as a person, as a human being, is starting to change. And that change is very much a result of information, new information that has come into our system, has been understood intellectually, and a thinking process, an investigation process has happened. And that thinking process, investigation process has revealed aspects of life, dynamics of life that we hadn't seen before, especially just to give you an example of what I mean by dynamics of life. Um, we start to maybe appreciate the impersonal unfolding of events um, that had never been treated as impersonal unfoldings and rather taken to be something that the myself or the other made happen. And an example of this would be, you know, a tree branch falling and denting your car, for example. It's very much something that just happened as a result of, we could explain it according to the laws of physics. You know, the tree was old or it had termites. It was a windy day and the wind um, put enough pressure on the branch that the branch broke off the power, the, the force of gravity, pulled the branch to the ground and your car just happened to be under there and it then meant pressure on the metal, which has bent the metal. And all of that is just a happening according to the laws of physics and the fact that your car happened to be under the tree, the fact that the termites had got into the tree and the wind blew a certain way is all um, not attributable to an individual agent, but rather all a result of a very impersonal movement of what I'm describing as laws of physics at the moment. And as we start to look more closely, we might start to appreciate that 
the functioning of the human being is also very much governed by laws of physics or cosmic laws. We could just say cosmic laws. Um, and those <clears throat> movements that we have been convinced are very personal start to be seen as much less personal. Now, there's a phenomena that um, needs to be appreciated. And the phenomena is that sometimes things feel very different to how they actually are. And we often take feeling or experience to be a representation of truth. And one of the rules that we have to remember is that feelings, experience, is a subjective um, thing. And it's not something absolute. And just like our thoughts, we might have a thought about I don't know what time the bus comes. And we might be convinced that it comes at 10 to 11 in the morning. And in fact, it might be 10 to 10. And in our head, we're convinced it's 10 to 11. And we'll be absolutely sure, and then we'll find out we're wrong. And so just like thoughts can be wrong, feelings about things can be wrong. And yet, the thought feels very true, and a feeling <coughs> feels very true. So you could have a what we might call an intuition about something. And it feels like, yes, this is what I need to do. And then in hindsight, we see, oh, that was not, that feeling was not a representation of truth. It was fallible. And unless we've got this rule and start thinking about it, that feelings are not a representation of truth, we can get um, lost in defending a concept that we have about something, a concept that has been put in place because that's how it felt. And as long as we don't question that what we feel may not be the truth, we'll be adamant about a concept. So an example of this is that the process that I spoke about where the intellectual understanding starts going deeper and deeper and deeper by repetition, that process may not be evident. It might not be evident that that's what's happening. And so then at a certain point, the process has had its effect and what you and then something happens let's say the baby starts talking um and when the baby talks for the first time they're not familiar with why they're talking they don't know why that's happened or how it's happened and what they have is the experience of speaking. And when they go to the, let's say they could think about it, if we went to the experience, we might describe it as this sound just came out of me. Um, and so that's how we'll describe it, because that's how it feels. And the feeling may not at all represent how or why these things happen. And if we go with the feeling and say that the feeling tells me how it is, we might miss something. So let's use another example that's um, more understandable maybe. The sun appears to rise and set. Now, if we go on the um, how it feels, how it's experienced, 
it makes sense that we say the sun rises and it sets. And so in practical terms, we have to continue saying the, the sun rises and it sets. I'm not suggesting that we need to now start boycotting the description that says, oh, I watched an amazing sunrise or an amazing sunset. In practical terms, I think that's how we need to refer th to, to life because that's how it appears. Um, and yet in our head, if we understand that this is the paradox, this is what we need to be able to have flexibility with and understand, that I understand that it appears like the sun rises and sets, but I know that in fact, um, or at least from the conventional wisdom, is that the sun doesn't move and the earth is what is moving in such a way that makes it appear like the sun rises and sets. And so if we can hold that understanding about the dynamic of the sun and the earth position relative to each other, we can continue to say the sun rises and sets. And we can also understand what is really happening and why it happens. Um, now, sometimes we will, in this process of understanding the paradox, we will realize that the sun doesn't actually move and start boycotting our own description of the sun rising and setting. And that's just part of the process of um, introducing something new, introducing something that didn't have space before. And it's very important, this is what often doesn't happen in a lot of spiritual seeking, because it needs to, we need to sort of swing to the other extreme and say, no, the sun doesn't move. I'm not going to say the sun rises and sets. That would be ignorance, is what we, um, because we've always believed it to be absolutely the way it appears. And so now we say, oh, I'm not going to get caught in ignorance anymore. Um, I'm seeking truth. So now I'm going to say, there is no such thing as sunrise and sunset. There is earth moving. Um, and so we boycott describing sunrise and sunset. And at some point we start realizing that that is um, creating a disconnection from the practical experience. And then the two get integrated. And when the two are integrated, we have no problem talking about sunrise and sunset. In fact, in practical terms, that is um, uh, a more accurate description and yet at the same time, if someone were to come and say to you, hey, do you know that the sun doesn't rise and doesn't set? You go, absolutely, I know that. And they might say, well, why do you call it a sunrise? You say, because it's a paradox that it's both. In practical terms, I'm seeing it from the perspective of someone on the earth. And so relative to the, to the perceiver, the sun rises and sets. And yet... I'm not ignorant of the deeper workings. Um, and so it's, it's very important not to hang on to one or the other, but to be able to hold the things um, uh, and, and see them in this holistic, holistic manner. So um, our understanding of... Uh, life not being personal or um, not being the doer or not being attached to outcomes, knowing that my happiness isn't to be found in outcomes. Um, when it is total, it's seen very much as, and felt, should I say, it's felt very much as not an intellectual understanding, depending on how we, what, how we're using the word intellectual understanding. So most things in life, we understand intellectually, we don't, um, <clears throat> we haven't spent sufficient time in a, a, 
in relation to a lot of things, understanding it deeply enough that it goes beyond an intellectual understanding. So many things um, that we talk about, we know intellectually and can have a conversation about it, but it hasn't become deeply, deeply ingrained part about ourself or, or deeply ingrained part of us. Um, and so there is a, a, a very specific sense about when we know something intellectually, because essentially there's a narrative we're thinking about it and, and talking about it and thinking about it and talking about it. Some things like your name, you do know beyond the, what the common description of an intellectual understanding will be. And then you find that you respond <clears throat> automatically. Even if someone calls your name in a distance, you turn. Whereas if you don't know your name deeply, so if you've <clears throat> um, pretended to be someone else and you've taken on a new name for the day and you <clears throat> tell the attendant, oh, my name is John. And he says, oh, nice to meet you, John. And you think that went well. I convinced him my name is John. And then he calls John. You are not likely to turn, like if he calls your name five minutes later, John, because it hasn't been deeply ingrained into you that you're John because you're just using a, a false name. Um, <clears throat> and so a lot of... Um, you know, if a teacher is teaching or if a seeker has gone through a significant amount of process, they'll say, oh, this is not about um, any change that has happened on the body-mind level. Um, this is nothing to do with the intellect because another part of the experience is that there is a, a distance created between the object's observed and that which is witnessing the ob object and it's a tangible change in the quality of where life is seen from now that change happens after a process someone might meditate for years might um, abide go through a, a period of their thoughts getting cut off or abiding in I am. And at some point there is this, um, in, in some ways that it manifests, a shift and um, suddenly life is seen differently. And we don't understand the process. We, uh, a lot of times the process isn't described to us. In fact, it's often said that it's got nothing to do with the body. We have to remember our true nature. Um, and just be that, and that everything arises in awareness and that it doesn't follow causality. And so when this shift happens, it's all held within the frame, that framework that has all of those concepts where we're not thinking about causal explanations, we're not thinking about time, we're not thinking about ourselves as a physical entity. We've been told that what we are is awareness, and awareness is a very special thing that, um, you know, has omniscient sort of qualities and what have you and so then there is this sense of, and it feels like the feeling remember the feeling can feel like because we're grounded in a way um, in a different part of the human being and there is this sense of awareness the feeling can be oh, I am awareness and I am not the body and because that's what it feels like and we haven't had an alternative description that we've investigated the I am awareness um, belief or concept gets put in place and until such time as someone says hey could it be that there is a person and that person was shaped a certain way and then a process happened and the person got reshaped by the process and the output of the person, um, which doesn't tell us about the workings of how that output came about, it just feels a certain way. You wake up in the morning and there's the, you know, the experience of the bedroom, and it doesn't 
um, explain or feel like it's got to do with uh, whatever is happening in the background. Could it be that there's a person, they were shaped a certain way and the experience was once one way and then enough change happened that the experience flipped and is now different? And could it be that the sense of being formless awareness in which everything arises is actually a mode of the person, a changed person? Um, and as we start thinking about it, we might say, wow, why didn't I consider that to be the case? And we'll look at it and we say, of course I didn't consider that to be the case because the teachings that made the difference, the teachings that helped bring about the shift, didn't talk about me being a person that needs to change, but rather the teaching says you are not the person, you are awareness. And that there is no time, there is no space, there is no causality, everything is spontaneous and fresh. And so that's why we end up with that idea. Um, and it needs life to come in, in a certain way, deliver new conditioning that says, you know, really, it, it, it just needs to deliver something that makes us think. So one of the explanations I've put forward here that says a feeling doesn't necessarily tell you the truth. Um, and then I use an example about the sunset and the sunrise and the feeling experience, the experience is the sunsets and sunrises. It's not telling you the absolute truth. And so when you feel that you are awareness, is that the truth or is that the feeling? Um, and so that, that example might be enough for someone to go, oh, I've never thought about it that way. And then they might question the I am awareness, which is um, important. What, what is very good is, they have a, there is has been an awakening to the awareness aspect of the human being. But if one were to go around claiming to be formless awareness and not the body, whereas in fact one is still the body, but the body is now reconfigured in such a way that the experience is different. Um, and it feels different. But So if you go around claiming, I am formless awareness, in fact what you are is a deluded person that has had a shift um, that is a very beneficial shift because it's created space, it's created non-identification. What if you can have a person that is not identified with outcomes, not identified with themselves as a separate entity, but rather um, sees themselves, the body and the, the thinking and the consciousness, the whole kit and caboodle, as an expression, one of the many expressions of the totality of life. Um, so, you know, um, what I started off saying is in the last few satsangs, you've heard me talking about the importance of conditioning, new conditioning, and how it affects the intellect. And I wanted to um, follow up in this satsang with one of the key points that explains why it may seem like it has nothing to do with the intellect. So talking about how we can define the intellect in quite a narrow way where it's just the active thinking about something where we, you know, it's not spontaneous, not deeply known. Um, and so if we, if we have that description of the intellect, then we say, yes, it's, it's got nothing to do with the intellect. However, if we can appreciate that the spontaneous movement, which becomes much more effortless and is therefore much more direct in a sense. There isn't a gap um, where who I am has to think about life a certain way and then um, respond or justify things, but rather it has become so ingrained that there is an automatic response. So an example of this is when we become completely convinced because of a repeated um, awareness of our own experience, 
when we become completely convinced that pleasure and pain are a natural flow of each moment of life, that what happens in the moment is not in my control, that pain is a very um, valid part of the unfolding of the duality of life, pleasure and pain, male and female, health and disease, wealth and poverty, all of these are interconnected opposites. They're part of the duality of life, which is part of the paradox. So we have the non-duality means that the whole of life is the combination of pleasure and pain. And um, from one perspective, we can see it from an outside perspective where it's a bit like a multicolored ball um, there is only one ball, but it has many colors. And so when you're looking at the one ball, you don't, um, the seeing the many colors doesn't mean you don't see the one, the ball as a ball. Um, so to appreciate the non-duality of life is to be able to see the whole of the present moment, the pleasure and the pain, um, the mix of health and disease, wealth and poverty, good deeds and bad deeds, and see that all as the whole as it's meant to be, as it is, the, the duality of life. And not um, become highly polarized and identified with only the good, um, only the pleasure, which really then means that we're not seeing attitudinally the other half of the whole and so that creates a separation which really obscures the whole so holding the duality the non-duality is to see the whole and to see the pleasure and pain and then also acknowledge that the, there is pleasure and there is pain without um, meaning that the non-dual falls away so it's about holding both together. Um, I wonder what point I was going to make. <laughs> uh. So let's see if we go back to the, the main point. Um, Maybe it's time for a little break. So as someone really starts to appreciate, um, because they keep observing, following the pointers, that the flow of life is pleasure and pain, and that when pain happens, it's a completely normal part of life. Um, and so what uh, I was speaking with someone recently, and they said, you know, um, a funny thing happened, um, that they were driving and they parked their car and they forgot to get a parking ticket and um, when they came back or on their way back to the car they realized oh I didn't get a parking ticket uh, I didn't buy a parking ticket so I wonder if I'll get a fine and as they got back to the car they saw a yellow parking fine on their windscreen and they said this was proof that the understanding is going deep because he said I couldn't give a damn about the fact that I had a parking ticket. And um, the and then he said, well, let me let me be more thing. As when I saw the thing, the parking ticket, I went, damn. And then realized that he couldn't give a damn. Which means, of course, the damn is the biological reaction. Like it's not your preference to get a parking ticket. So there is a spontaneous in the moment biological reaction to pain in the moment and 
then straight away the pain ends and isn't turned into horizontal suffering about blame and shame towards oneself, blame towards the parking inspector and the laws that are, um, you know, you know, charge people for not following the rules and all of that. Um, and so it's a sign that there's this deep understanding that, yes, these things happen, that it's not an attack on who I am, it's not an attack on my happiness. And so as that goes deep, really deep, it becomes part of who you are. And so then the teacher will say, you know, the thing is that when I'm talking about an understanding that my happiness isn't to be found in the flow of life, it can seem like it's intellectual. Or I will describe it as intellectual because I've um, put out the framework in the way I'm describing today. Whereas another teaching, another teacher and another teaching, not that they're wrong, but because it's a different emphasis, they're, they're emphasizing different aspects, will say, you know, the understanding is not intellectual. The understanding is... Um, it's unexplainable, they might say. Or the uh, understanding is, is not an understanding, but it's rather a knowing yourself as that formless um, awareness. Now, in this teaching, um, what I would say is the formless awareness is an aspect of the human being. And becoming aware of that and grounding in that and having access to that allows us to step out of the dimension of the thinking that knows ourself only as a psychological identity, believing that my um, you know, worth and my meaning and purpose will be found when I achieve this. And so we drop out of that and find, ah, I am. This is the purpose of life, to just be, to be connected to myself, to not have this continuous striving for... Um, outcomes that we believe will deliver fulfillment. So as we rest in that part of ourself, we start finding that my happiness isn't dependent on outcomes, it goes deeper and deeper. And then we find situations happen and no, res no response, no, no psychological involvement, no resistance to life. And if we look at it at how it feels, and this is why peace of mind, which is what we're really looking for, is emphasized. What we're looking for is peace of mind. And peace of mind is not the gaining of anything, but rather the absence of suffering, the non-arising of suffering. So, of course, it doesn't feel intellectual because it's simply the non-arising of the old intellect. However, the old intellect no longer arises because new intellect has come in dissolved the old intellect and as the new intellect has got to the point where it's dissolved all the old intellect it's so deep that what we can call the intellectual concept falls away too or at least it appears to have fallen away and then we're left with what we might from one angle called our true nature that just isn't affected by pleasure or pain and all of these descriptions are accurate from the perspective we see them so we might then get to appreciate ah that's why they say it's not intellectual because their experience the teacher's experience the the um the seeker the the one who is now free of suffering says you know i just turn up in life events happen and suffering doesn't arise. Life is not taken personally. Um, and they'll say, and it's not intellectual. It's much, much deeper than that. It's um, because of having grounded into my essence, let's say. And I'm not saying that's wrong. I, I'd love, I, 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 I'll say it that way. It's important to say it that way, just like it's important to say the sun rises. And it's also important to point out that maybe what is described as a change that is not intellectual 
is actually a process of the mind receiving information, assessing, dropping old ideas, internally wire, wiring is changing such that we are essentially a different structure. And at some point we find that we interpret life from a completely different perspective and therefore suffering no longer is part of the output. So in conclusion, I'll just talk about um, two statements. One is where a teacher or a teaching will maybe say something along the lines here that I'm not talking to the intellect. I'm talking to your heart or I'm talking to presence or I'm talking to I am. And why that is said, I, I would say, on the one hand, you can say it's not accurate because if I, whatever the teaching teacher says, even if they say, there is no one here to do anything, so stop um, thinking that you are someone, that's a concept, right? That, that's a concept that is being delivered to the one hearing it. And if you go beyond certain concepts that stop us from thinking that um, there is, you know, when we, what's really happening is someone is giving you information and it's being heard. And that information might be that there is no one, so don't think along the lines that there is someone. Um, and then we might stop thinking along the lines that there is someone, but only because we, through our intellect, have heard a concept that says there's no one. Um, so why so why does a teaching say I'm not talking to the intellect I'm talking to your your heart let's say or to I am and you don't need to listen to what I'm saying from the intellect and that's because once again I'm, I'm as I said at the beginning, often the way we hear things is from the um, doership that wants to get it intellectually, um, but not in the intellectual that goes deeper and deeper and deeper, but that reinforces the false sense of self. And so saying that I'm not talking to the intellect is in a way instruction to do it differently, to interpret it differently, to be in the space differently. It's giving the person permission to relax. And it's, look, if you don't, don't even listen to the words, that you can just be in the space and the energy will do the work. So that can be a concept that is delivered. And it can disarm the doer. In fact, it's much better to listen from your heart, or meaning don't listen through the intellect. Now you can see maybe why that's so valuable to say. Because someone can come in and go, ah, oh, what a relief, I don't even need to do, I don't need to do it the way I've always done it in satsang. So come in and you can just relax. Now, the, tr the, the reality is that you don't need to listen intently because the intelligence of the body is such that it's an instrument and the hearing will still pick up what's going on even if you're not um, on your um, total alert and thinking. In fact, that can create a receptivity and it can create a receptivity not of everything that is said, but maybe one thing within a relaxed um, being in the room where maybe your attention is more interested in allowing everything and seeing everything arising. I remember when I first went to Ramesh and he said, so what did you think about the talk? <laughs> I don't think he was so happy about this. And the truth was I was so relaxed in the talk and I was just looking at the ocean out through the window that was behind him. And I was watching the waves. It was quite a windy day and there was a lot of white caps on the waves. And I said, to be honest, I've just been watching the, the waves. <laughs> and um, he said, oh, well, all right. <laughs> um, 
and wasn't so impressed with that because the fact is there's so much important information in the talk. Um, and I'm and I know I got that while I was watching the waves. I wasn't really just watching the waves. Bits were coming in because sometimes I would listen and something came in. Um, and it's a much more receptive way for the important things to come in. Um, now, is it true that they're not talking to the intellect? Um, I would say that the body is still um, receiving all of the inputs of the um, environment, and that's being received by the body-mind organism, and it's being processed by the intelligence of the body. So it might not be the intellect that we know as the intellect, but it's being all teachings are talking to the person. Now, when the, so once again, I'm not talking to the person. Maybe it's saying I'm not talking to the doer. Um, I'm not telling the doer to go and do anything. Um, and some teachings will actually say I am. All teachings are talking to the doer because um, if there wasn't a doer, you wouldn't, as in the belief of a doer, there's no point teaching because the person would be free and so there's no teaching required um, so we might say we're not talking to the doer but all the teachings are designed for a system that has the doership in it so i hope you can maybe be completely confused by now <laughs> yeah. um no but uh yes I think we'll take some questions. Hi, Holger. Hello, Roger. Hello, hello. It's so beautiful, so wonderful when you didn't know anymore what to speak and just to to pause. Uh -huh, yes. Um, the last days, um, actually, the last 24 hours or so, I had a lot of um, headache. Mm -hmm. And um, interestingly, suddenly I had this idea, or oh, I, could, I could die any minute, any moment. Mm -hmm. And th th this was just so weird because I suddenly felt so attached to my little life. I mean, um, most of the time I couldn't care less and always wanted to escape or be somewhere else. Mm -hmm. And this is just kind of weird. Um, but it doesn't bother me in a way. It's just interesting that this comes up. It's maybe just a biological thing. Mm. Well, um I guess you would know better than me, but if um, ordinarily, I think if you're trying, if you feel like yes, death would be a relief, um, uh, that's maybe an indication. I don't know. Tell me if I'm right. It's an indication that life can sometimes be quite heavy, um, and so the idea of death is like a, a relief from that. So maybe if now you're thinking, no, death's not so good, it might be a sign that. Um, things are lightening up. <laughs> what do we? What do you think? I mean, um, yes, things become easier and lighter and uh, quite beautiful. And I'm really grateful for your satsangs. They contribute to this ease and uh, clarity and delight and joy. I mean, it's so simple. Yeah. Yes. Well, I'm glad to be able to do them. Um, you know, someone was talking about the current um, situation. And as you know, there's um, some groups, some people that are particularly convinced about all sorts of um, theories um, that uh, generally fit under the heading of conspiracy theory. Now, what's interesting is that there's so many conspiracy theories um, that at least some of them have to be, you know, inaccurate because there are many that even contradict each other um so maybe what some of the conspir what are called conspiracy theories might actually be 
accurate. But at least we have to um, uh, be open to the fact that a lot of them, or at least some of them, are not ac accurate. Um, you, you know, well, I won't even go into... Um, I won't go <laughs> go into that. Um, but what it does is it starts to get us to com contemplate that if even one of these conspiracy theories was correct, um, wow, life is completely different to what we imagine, and we are potentially in imminent danger from you know the group that is um, got all these uh, ill intentions for humanity, whichever group that is, whether it's the aliens, whether it's the um, super rich controlling all of humanity or, or whatever, um, then one of the benefits of this is that it really maybe gets us to consider um, and I, I'm not suggesting that we consider it and start freaking out and thinking it is one of these things because the thing is it could be none of the things i i mean my view is i couldn't care less about all of those theories because um thinking about them isn't going to do anything about it i'll find out which one it is if any of them when it happens um but what it does do is it sort of um gets you to loosen your mind and think well in, it could be um, maybe one of these things. Or a meteor could just pop out of nowhere and, you know, bring the end of civilization. Or the earth suddenly cracks open in half. Um, and because, you know, we wake up each morning and everything's relatively in, in good order, we assume that that's how it will always be. And when you think about it, it might not be. You know, you just wake up one morning and everything is radically different to the point that you're about to die because of the difference. Um, and so if you think about this and it goes too far, then you're going to go into existential crisis. Um, and that's not what I'm suggesting, but for some people, they'll think about it and start going, actually, life is maybe short, um, limited. You know, I've heard two stories in the last two days about youngish people who have died of a heart attack, and they happened to be extremely healthy, um, sports-oriented um, very conscious about the food and they've dropped dead at ages of under 50. Um, and life is potentially short. And so one of the benefits out of all of this upheaval that's going on at the moment is that maybe it gets us to really appreciate that what is life about? Um, if there is another 10 years, 20 years, two years, three days, whatever it is. What is life? What, what, what maybe um, it changes the priority of how our time is spent or how the thinking happens. And um, So, yeah, I think our mortality is, um, if we don't face it, I don't think there's a potential to really appreciate life. Um, so we need to face our mortality. It's really one of the hallmarks of spiritual awakening is to really realize, I am going to die. Um, but in facing our mortality, hopefully the fact that we're going to die becomes completely inconsequential. Um, and so for me, the, um, the thought that I may not be at some point um, really has no, psycholo there's no psychological me to have an issue with that. Because the way I see life is it's an experience happening. You wake up in the morning and there's the experience. 
And um, it's pleasure, it's pain. We've all experienced quite a lot of pleasure, quite a lot of pain. We know what exper- what pleasure or pain is. Um, and so even if there's no suffering and there's just peace of mind, pleasure and pain, we start to appreciate that life is the experience arising in consciousness. And each night in deep sleep, the experience falls away. And there's no one there to have any issue with the fact that experience has fallen away. Um, And then we wake up in the morning and there's life again. Um, And so what is life? It's To me, life is an experience. Um, And it's not meant to be an infinite experience. Um, It's an experience and experiences like books, like movies, like anything, has to have an end to round it off. And death is the final chapter, uh, as I see it. So if life is an experience, and some people have an experience that is you know, limited to eight years, someone dies as a child, someone else dies at the age of 40, um, someone else dies at the age of 90 or 100. So, okay, the experience is longer in duality, but the fact is that it's more of the same, more or less, more of either pleasure or pain, um, life circumstance. And at some point we go, well, I've experienced enough pleasures. So I might not have experienced all of the pleasures, but I've experienced enough to know what pleasure is. And it's something that comes in, it's great, it's nice, but it doesn't deliver us more than pleasure. And the same with pain. So even a very painful situation will be there and then it's finished. Um, So you break your leg, it's painful, and then it fades into the past. And and the same with, um, you know, a lot of traumas, unless, of course, it's it, it forms a, a traumatic uh, knot, which then means that the event of the past that was really, really quite short-lived, probably, or at least it's not happening now, keeps getting dragged into the present moment. Well, that's a, another experience. That, that means the experience is, is flavored that way. So the more we can appreciate even the suffering as part of the experience, then we say, well, that's life. Life is the experience. Let's see. I can't escape it, so I have to, it's about the experience. And death is the end of the experience. Um, It's the psychological me that thinks about death and creates a whole story about what is going to be left behind, what isn't going to be experienced. Um, If the psychological me isn't there, we think it's like deep sleep. No, there can't be a problem. So um, maybe that's how, uh, how we can appreciate life. Beautiful. In the Bible it says, the last enemy to be destroyed is death. Mm. Yes, I'm happy with that. Mm. Okay, good, good, good. Okay, thank you so much, Roger. Um, gratitude, and um, I leave the stage for some other people. Thank you. Thank you, Holger. Hi, Himalika. Hi, hi, sir. Hello. Thank you. Thank you again for doing this. Uh, you're amazing. Uh, I I just love, love you. <laughs> um, you. Actually, I wanted to ask a question about uh, attachments. Mm-hmm. Uh, nowadays, I'm, I'm having this very... Uh, you can say a very strong emotion about uh, uh, about a person mm-hmm. and uh, uh, even after understanding about the impermanence of things and uh, what all <laughs> uh, i just can't i just can't escape this emotion you know mm-hmm. my my every my every move my every uh, emotion gets influenced by that person's action mm-hmm. And I don't know, there's two people talking inside my body. I don't understand why this is happening. Like one person is telling another person, you know, the impermanence of thing, you know, 
uh, things don't last and all that and one person just not accepting something is stopping me to fully realize this thing mm -hmm. i cannot i and because of this i cannot enjoy any person you know like you said about that sunrise and sun sets mm -hmm. i i am just stuck at there rising and setting i cannot enjoy the sun <laughs> yeah um <laughs> Yeah, these these feelings are very powerful, um, and there isn't someone um, who is having the experience, but rather the experience and the someone are contained, or the the sense of someone is contained in the experience. So, when that arises, the attachment arises. It arises out of the structure your structure um so it could be if we go to the um the script indian scriptures type of explanation it will talk about um you know your your makeup and specifically here we're talking about your the vasanas and the samskaras um so that's one way it's described in a, a fairly impersonal way um, that the vasanas and samskaras have been set in place and when they kick into action you have this experience you're describing this craving this longing where nothing else seems relevant um, and there isn't really um, much you can do about it from one perspective we have to surrender to the and and surrender really means see it um as a wave that comes over us or is over us for a certain period of time and if you feel it like any form of suffering so what i describe as attachment to outcome deeply ingrained belief that your happiness is to be found in pleasure sounds very conceptual right but in practice when you what it what that description is referring to is a feeling that doesn't at all feel like a belief that my happiness is found in outcomes it doesn't it doesn't tell us that we we just feel this yearning for the person let's say um and so when you feel it it's an energy you know you can call it an energy um i'm suggesting that the energy comes from a belief but the belief is it, the suggestion is not that you change the belief because as i'm describing it it's deeply ingrained it's um you could even describe it describe it as karmic past life experience um and really those once again those concepts are not necessarily truth but they're really trying to describe our makeup and how we feel in life as being something really out of our control something inescapable when it arises now that's not to say it won't change over time but we don't know how it's going to change if it's going to change when it's going to change um listening to satsangs listening to my very explanation now may well be part of change um but we don't know i don't know whether what i'm going to say will bring about any change you don't know but you'll find out and the finding out or the change if it happens is also um a result in a sense it's no different to the yearning that comes up which is a, a result of your current makeup which includes i mean your current makeup really means what's there up to now which who knows let's say it might go back twenty thousand years um which then makes us say oh wow that's it's much more than what i'm consciously doing but it's infused with so much that creates this so humans as a as a general rule have this attachment to outcome and 
deeply, uh, one of the deepest attachments to outcome is an attachment to love. Meaning we are completely convinced, almost you could say on a cellular level, um, that that's, that's where the, the identity resides when it's deeply ingrained because of everything that came before. Um, on a cellular level, we really believe that life will one day be okay when I have love. And um, on a very unconscious level, it might be the love of God, but then it gets projected out. And one of the most obvious um, sort of settings for love is romantic settings. So it's very easy for us to become attached to romantic love. Um, and it, it just lends itself to our deeply ingrained identity. Um, and I don't know that I could suggest or should suggest um, anything more than this explanation, which is an explanation of dynamics. Um, and the, pur the purpose of describing all of this is so that hopefully something in your system um, doesn't so your system sort of lets go about how can I change this how can I do something about this and rather adopts more of a seeing this in the light of what I've just described so seeing the yearning as an energy appreciating it as a feeling as part of the experience it's not pleasant right but remember life is not pleasure 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 um, that our destiny includes uncomfortableness suffering pain from time to time and the opposites um, periods of peace periods of pleasure um, and so what I, i'm describing hopefully can create a, a witnessing uh, um, and I'm not even saying that you need to witness but just a simple um, appreciation oh yes here is this deeply ingrained mm -hmm. uncomfortableness that has just that's that just arises sweeps mm -hmm. over me um, and if that arises it's um, it's more of the attitude of non-doership because the attitude of non-doership is this recognition oh yes this is happening and it's out of my control it's a result of my genes and up-to-date conditioning um, which as i've said could extend back who knows ten thousand years twenty thousand years um, and and not even who knows you know if you look at where human genes have come from that came you could trace it all the way back to the very beginning um that's the attitude of non-doership that sort of is resigned yes this is how it is right now and and one last Thanks, thing I, one last thing that I'll, I'll add is the truth is that um beyond or beneath that feeling um, we'll find that we don't need love to be complete. That, that even though the feeling tells us that the absence of this person is a disaster to who I am, so that's what the feeling tells us. The truth of the matter is that that feeling is not the truth. It's there, it is a feeling, it's uncomfortable, so I'm not denying that feeling being there, but it isn't a reflection of the truth of who we are and what we need. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Pleasure. Thank you, sir. And uh, actually, uh, I, I really understand this thing, whatever you said, mm -hmm. and it, it, you make it sound so easy. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Hello, Peter. 
Hello. <clears throat> Hi, do you hear me? Yes, loud and clear. Okay, good. Um, yes. Uh, hi, Roger. Uh, thank you, as usual. Um, uh, my question, without trying, without try, trying to, without trying to ramble here, uh, which may be challenging, um, but um, I guess it goes. It it, it um, um, refers to a satsang, previous satsang I listened to recently, in which you brought up a metaphor which I found um, quite intriguing. Uh, you talked about, um, um, I think this said some, some time ago, you talked about uh, identifying ghosts, uh, about a metaphor you talked about, you know, peeking around corners and spying on, you know, quote unquote ghosts. Mm -hmm. And uh, I just, I guess I wanted to, um, I, I assume you were, um, referring to um, ghosts were a uh, metaphor for, I guess, feelings of blame and guilt, perhaps, or narratives or, mm -hmm. um, you know, various attachments. And um, so I guess I, you know, maybe if you could clarify that, but I guess the follow-up question is, um, to me, I guess that's what you uh, are referring to when you talk about investigation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and to me, um, and, I, and I, the, the, the metaphor was appealing to me or intriguing because I find myself often um, engaged in these kinds of thoughts or, I guess, investigations. Um, yeah, and often, often in, in, um, pertaining to um, you know, my, my own relationship, speaking of relationships and, and love and attachment to love. Um, and sometimes it, I, on one, on one hand, it feels like, oh, I'm, I'm investigating this and it's important to identify these, these ghosts, mm -hmm. so to speak. But then it, I find it's also sort of, uh, I, I, I'm confused about the difference between, or the differentiation between the thinking mind you know, being engaged in that mode of the thinking mind and then the investigation. Sorry for the, mm -hmm. I, mm -hmm. hopefully you can sort of parse that out and uh, respond somehow. <laughs> sure. Um, so, yes, the, yes. Me the, metaphor, yeah. the metaphor I had used, I think, was um, where someone was given instruction that, you, you know, you're in a house with a lot of ghosts in it. And really what we need you to do is to observe them. And you have to be very quiet yeah. um, and, you know, sort of just peek in and look at what they're doing so that you can then pass the information on. And you sort of have no other role um, other than to just observe. And, yes, you're right, the ghosts. Um, so when you go past the room, it's really um, – an example of a present moment experience and if you have a certain feeling or thought arising it's to witness that as if you were outside the door just peeking in seeing the ghosts so it, it sort of makes you a an audience rather than a partic participant um and, Got it. and so yeah hopefully you can um that attitude towards your own thoughts and feelings might kick in um and so, you know, the notion that you're just peeking around the door, you don't want to disturb the ghost means in a way you're, you have to remain on the outside, uh, just an observer. Um, and not even, hopefully, it's not even the person doing the observing, but rather silent witnessing um, kicks in. So the thinking, um, even thinking about the concepts, uh needs to come after the seeing and the seeing is done not through the concept if that makes some some sense um now well, so you're it's uh, yeah go on well sorry i was just I'm sorry i was just saying yeah so i was um sounds like you're 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 talking about witnessing the, the notion of witnessing uh, yeah, and something the, which is yeah, 
And the witnessing tends to, you know, first you need to um, have be delivered a concept that talks about the fact that you have thoughts, for example, and that the thoughts come and they go and they're not what you are. They can be seen from outside. So <clears throat> first there needs to be that conditioning that is received by the intellect. And at some point we find that um, once thoughts be, are seen, um, then it becomes a much more silent witnessing um, because you don't need to keep thinking about witnessing the thoughts um, because the description of the concept has already got you to, to now be able to see thoughts and feelings arising. And so then it can become much more silent seeing, which doesn't seem like it's got much to do with the thinking and the intellect. Um, now, where this often gets interfered with, um, where, where it doesn't happen that way, is that if something is described as not ideal, our attachment to pleasure and um, aversion to pain and the fact we take things personally says, oh, I've got to do something about something that's not ideal. Um, and just the derivation of what I'm describing is, so if, I, <clears throat> if someone does some work and I've asked them to, I don't know, lay some bricks and cement and bricks, and they do it and I come back and it's crooked, right? It hasn't been lined up. So I could say, you've laid the bricks crooked. Um, now, when I say that, I, I'm really not so interested in blaming and making it personal. I'm just saying, well, the bricks are crooked. Um, we're mm -hmm. going to have to do something about it. So it's just a, a statement of fact, more or less. Now, if someone mm -hmm. hears that statement of fact, what often will happen, they'll go into a big defense you know, mode. And I'm, they might, I might say, you're, mis you're misunderstanding me. I didn't say it as an attack on you as a person. Um, you're taking it that way because of this deeply ingrained you know, personal identity. Um, and it's inevitable that that's going to happen. But the fact is that it was just a description. Now, the, the bricks are crooked. I can't tell you that you've done a great job, or I could, but the fact is that they're crooked. Um, and this, this um, movement of our identity to push away pain, which we take very personally, and crave pleasure, which we also take personally, um, that tends to get infused into the seeking. And so if I describe the ghosts as a disturbance on our peace of mind, and what we are really looking for is peace of mind, what we're really looking mm -hmm. for in life is peace of mind, and the thinking mind is a disturbance of our peace of mind. That peace of mind is the absence, mm -hmm. the non-arising of suffering. Um, now that's mm -hmm. just a description, right? I'm not telling anyone to mm -hmm. um, insist on peace of mind, to resist those things that disturb peace of mind, because that would be less peace of mind and more suffering. Um, but inevitably when we hear that what we're really looking for is peace of mind, Attachment to outcome says, great, thank you for telling me what I should be attached to. And we then told suffering arises and it disturbs our peace of mind. And then they say, great, thank you for telling me what I have to get rid of. Um, and that's very different. When, when that happens, um, that's sort of like the person in the house seeing the ghosts and then deciding that they've got to go and shoo the ghosts out of the room and clear the room so that there's no ghosts. And it's like, no, 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 remember, you're just an observer. Your, mm -hmm. your mission isn't to... But they say, but you told me the ghosts were um, bringing down the value of the property or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I know, but we're going to deal with that differently and 
your job is to observe them, not to do anything about them. Mm -hmm. um, right. And often we go into seeking automatically with this craving for peace of mind and attitude, I am the one that is going to make it happen by stopping the suffering, for example. And ironically, mm -hmm. the the dissolving of the doership and attachment to outcome starts when, you know, that attitude towards the seeking becomes one of allowing it to happen rather than forcing it to, you know, unfold according to your your agenda. Right. So. Right. Okay. Yeah. That may, yeah. That's very helpful. Um, yeah. It's, it sounds like it's sort of, uh, cause I guess sometimes I interpret, for example, when you're talking about the idea of, you know, once you start noticing that you're engaged in thinking mind, um, activity, you, you talk about, you know, stop, uh, you know, invite that, bringing that intention and so which is which has actually proved fairly you know useful for me mm -hmm. um in some ways um but i guess there's a time i guess it's what you're talking about when you're you know when you mentioned spying on ghosts and without scaring them away it's sort of a lighter touch mm -hmm. i guess the, the 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 it's the sort of um difference between um analytical thinking and just witnessing, I guess, is that, I guess that's the distinction that I'm not, not struggling with. It's too strong of a word, but just trying to, um, is, is that sort of, because the analytical mind is sort of taking these stories or narratives or ghosts and trying to sort of figure them out. Yeah. Well, there, um, yeah, there, there is a benefit in the figuring out happening, but that's the crucial thing is that it, so it's like when you're looking at the ghosts and you've seen enough ghosts and then it suddenly, suddenly clicks. Oh, look, they seem to hover around the PowerPoints. Um, and so that thought has just happened as a result of observing enough of the ghosts and at the same time clicking or realizing, oh, they're always near a PowerPoint. Um, and then once that thought has arisen, you then continue to observe the ghosts. And sure enough, each time you check, is there a PowerPoint next to them? And there it is. So you then, um, another thought then happens. I, I wonder if they're fed by the electrical energy in the house. Um, and so those thoughts can arise, but they sort of arise as a consequence of what you're silently observing and so you can see well i didn't really create the um recognition they are always near powerpoint it required history to drag that out of me and the history was the observing um and sure enough one fine day it just clicks the thought is they're always near the PowerPoints. Um, now, whether, the, you know, when that thought comes up or if it comes up, if the correlation is seen, you might observe for years and years and years and that correlation just simply won't be seen. Um, but let's say it is, then, you know, we might tend to think, oh, I saw that. Um, and, on the one hand, yes, the thought arose as part of Roger because Roger was observing, but we also realize an aspect of it is I only had that thought because life put me in the observing position enough times that that thought then arose. So much so that you can say, because then we'll say, oh, but I observed them 20 times instead of realizing, you know, how easy it could be for life, your experience of life, to include no motivation to be interested in observing the ghosts in the room. 
And even if you're given the assignment, you might end up not engaging in the assignment. Um, so if we realize, well, even the very fact that I have a motivation to engage in the assignment is in itself a happening according to you know, innumerable factors that made me interested. And what I mean by made me interested, there was a, a motivation, a feeling to be engaged in the project. And it was only after there was a feeling of <clears throat> being interested in being engaged that the correlation was seen and that the thought arose. And so that's where we suddenly go, you know, what I thought was my conclusion on the one hand was a conclusion arising out of Roger, but then we also realize that it's far less personal than I think because of the fact that it was a culmination of so many other things that I wasn't in control of. Um, and so that's where hopefully the thinking um, goes, where it's a the thinking sort of just flows out of an awareness that is being guided by the concepts. So the concepts can, um, while you're witnessing with nothing really to do, just a, one of the concepts might pop up. Um, oh, that's pleasure in the moment. And even the concept popping up, you realize that's, not me thinking the concept, but rather the, th the concept arising because of my genes and up-to-date conditioning, i.e., you know, you listen to the satsangs and the concept became part of your genes and up-to-date conditioning. So seeing it as a much more um, flowing contemplation and analysis, there is an analysis in it, but it's um, much more devoid of the me there's less me psychological in the analysis. Um, and yeah, it's just feels much more like a happening. Okay. Right. Okay. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Thanks for dropping in. I think we'll take this yeah. last one last question. Thanks, Peter. Hello, Peter. Thank you. Oh, Peter, that's the same Peter. So, John. Hi, John. Hello, Roger. I, I, I lowered my hand because you've already been going for almost two hours. Uh, right. So thank you for taking my question. I was going to ask it next time. Okay, um, uh, it, it was related to your example of sitting, of listening to Ramesh and watching the ocean. Yes. And uh, find that your attention, uh, well, at my attention when I listen to you sometimes wanders. Mm -hmm. And then I, I, become, I become anxious and a bit disappointed because I realize that I'm not listening intently enough. Mm -hmm. So um, I'm just wanting to check something with you uh, to see if I'm not perhaps adding something fanciful to what you were saying. Mm -hmm. Because I heard you suggesting that even though one might not uh, pick up on every word or every concept that is being um, covered, the, the body somehow is able to pick up what is necessary. Mm -hmm. um, and so I've, I've found that if that is what you were saying, I found that very reassuring because it means that uh, I can let the body do the job and I don't have to work so hard at listening to to you, yes. uh, is, is that yes? Is indeed. that where you were? Indeed, um, uh, when the doership aspect falls away, we find that there's a great efficiency in the functioning of the in the body, um, and so um, yeah, so much of what we think makes life happen may actually be getting in the way. <laughs> um, and, you know, we know this, is, we've seen very many examples, experiments of subliminal thinking or sublim subliminal um, influences on our thinking. And that's because the body is picking up things um, 
that are in the environment that we're not consciously picking up on. Um, you know, so you'll be shown, I don't know, f five bananas um, in a sequence before a question is ans asked about what's your favorite fruit or what's the first fruit that pops into your head. Um, and the person's written banana down on a piece of paper. And so you then say banana and they'll say, huh, look what I've got on the piece of paper, banana. Um, and um, so our body is picking up things without us consciously recognizing what's in the environment. Um, and so there's, there's many aspects to this. You know, the truth is that in one satsang where I talk for two hours, would be unrealistic for someone to hear everything I say. And it's not necessary because if just one, um, one topic um, is heard, let's say I talk about 15 topics. I mean, we only really need to process one topic at a time. It can take weeks for a particular topic to be unpacked in our own thinking as we over time over a few weeks we'll see that the topic unfolds and unpacks and after week two of thinking about it not intently i have to think about it but it just keeps arising we realize we understand much more about the topic than before the contemplation about the topic happened and so there could be i don't know hundreds of subtopics within the overall teaching to be considered and that's why what um, a lot of feedback is people say, I listen to the satsang sometimes one or two a day. I mean, some people might listen to one a week or one a month, but um, one of the phenomena that I've seen and was the case for me, when you have um, a body inf of information that has lots of information in it, we keep going back to it because we know that there's more there that we haven't understood. And as we go back, we don't understand the whole. Each time we go back, we understand little bits of the whole. And after three years of listening to the satsangs once a week or once a day or whatever, it makes sense that it, the understanding is going to have deepened compared to someone who listened to a topic, uh, a talk once four years ago. Um, and... So on this note, I often um, also suggest that people don't be, af don't be afraid of listening to one talk 20 times. In fact, that, I mean, my seeking was often about reading the same book multiple times um, or listening to a satsang over and over. Some satsangs I had listened to when I was um, seeking, uh, I'd listen to the same one 20, 30 times because I knew that there's more to be understood. Um, some of the concepts and how they link together can be, um, you know, a little complicated, not really complicated, um, but you need to hear them over and over. And, and the first time you hear it, you might think it's saying, you know, this. And by the time you've heard it 10 times, <clears throat> you've really understood what it is saying. Um, and I know this sounds a bit different because I'm talking about understanding. Um, but in the, in the same way, if you listen to something 10 times, the bits that you've missed, eventually um, all the gaps get filled in. So in a way there's a trusting um, and there needs to be a trusting that let me be more relaxed. In being more relaxed, I'm more open for the one thing that needs to come in to come in. And um, the fact that you've zoned off for 10 minutes, you might as well say, oh, it wasn't destiny for me to hear any of that. It's not important for me to have heard it, what I zoned off for those 10 minutes. And then you might have the thought, but I think I should listen to this again because I did zone off for 10 minutes. So who knows what was in that 10 minutes? Um, but don't listen to it again forcefully. Just wait for the feeling to come up for you to listen to it again. <laughs> um, 
so yes, a, a lot of a lot of stuff is being picked up by the deeper intelligence of the body. The senses are working all the time um, in ways we don't even appreciate. So if you walk into a forest a um, hundred times, you, you go there each week, your body knows the energy of the forest. Um, and if one day there is a, a fire, a big forest fire, 10 kilometers away that you're not aware of, but the animals maybe are aware of that fire in the distance and maybe they've left the area and you walk into the forest and you might think something's different and it could well be that because your body is a sensitive instrument it has picked up that hey the forest is different but on a conscious level you don't know you don't you can't explain it um so we don't necessarily appreciate the fine tuning of our body and uh, it goes way beyond um, our conscious intellect. And an example of this is a baby, you know, that just hears words and at some point it just starts speaking and it just shows that, um, you know, we learn in interesting ways. Thank you. Yes, I, I, I think of late I've, I'm becoming more aware of the importance of the of the body and uh, letting it help um, with what sometimes seems to be a, an intellectual process. So thank you. Yes, very helpful and very reassuring. Mm. Thank you, Roger. You're welcome. So we'll we'll end it here, but. Um, on this note, come into the body because that's where we come into the present moment. That's where you can feel the tension. You can feel the uncomfortableness of the suffering. And then you'll go, ah, that's why it's an uncomfortableness with oneself. Um, you can feel uh, energy, uh, suffering as an energy, as something that just walks, comes over the system. We can, um, by coming into the body and feeling we have more capacity to see the present moment as a as a a whole arising within awareness so it's um it is very important to what we might call drop out of the head into the heart and in the heart it as this whole satsang has been about when we drop into the heart it's not that we're no longer available and the intellect isn't working. It's just a different aspect of the intellect and the less troublesome aspect. And um, when we drop out of the troublesome aspect of the intellect, we become much more connected to right here and right now. And that's the teachings are really pointing at what is here now. So coming into the body and feeling is, uh, is a gateway to um, presence really. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, John.